available. If people need more information afterwards, uh, we'll record it and put it up online too. But uh, we're really grateful to have everybody with us on this on this afternoon. Uh, as we were talking earlier, Saturday will be our family engagement program with sisterhood and brotherhood and just way to come together. And if you haven't yet met, met Rabbi Sadaloff, that's happening uh, on Saturday afternoon at Evelyn's Park. So you're all welcome starting at 4.30 to come by and say hello. Also Shavuot is this weekend. So Sunday night at five o'clock, Rabbi Sadaloff and I will be doing a program on reform uh, Jewish values and our observances and ways to connect to the Torah. And we'll be using some of the vignettes and video clips from the movie, The Women's Balcony, an Israeli film. Uh, it's a wonderful movie if you haven't seen it and we'll show different clips of it as we're gonna be talking and discussing the issues together. Monday morning at 10.30 will be the Yisker service and Shavuot festival service starting at 10.30 also by Zoom, which you can get the link from through the website by registering in advance for that. So that's what's happening. We're excited to welcome back Rabbi, uh, Dr. Zeptimus, I almost ordained you. Um, to, uh, I, I don't know if it's a promotion or a demotion now. <laughs> Might be both, might be both. And you um, you began our year talking about where we were with COVID with our monthly Midrash series and our speaker series that evolved from that. And we're sort of bookending now with you closing out our year with these Thursday afternoon programs. And we're very grateful to everything you've done, not just for our congregation and for co-chairing our adult education committee with Miriam as well this year, but also for the entire community and beyond how you've been able to help us navigate through this year of challenge and and pivoting uh, in everything that we've done. So Ed, really thank you for, for everything. And we're really looking forward to your comments and helping us get a better perspective uh, now that the year is almost over. Well, I, thanks for the very kind words. I'm going to share some slides with you. And then uh, uh, let's see, where is it? Here we go. Uh, you can see I have a, a little bit of an interesting theme, but I hope that will entice some conversation at the end of the, my formal comments. Okay, so everybody see my screen? You see it? Yeah. Good. I think most of us have heard the term justice, justice, you shall pursue from Deuteronomy. I think you'll see how we weave some of these things about social justice and disparities into the conversation about COVID and our Jewish values. So as, as uh, David said, we're gonna talk about where are we, what some of the lessons learned are. One of the things I can tell you that I learned over and over again in my profession, being in public health and infectious diseases uh, is humility. Uh, and this virus certainly has brought that out in people who wanna be honest about it, uh, since we know so very little about this. And one of the real challenges that many of us have had that people have had a lot of opinions and I, and I love this quote from Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Those of you who are old enough know he was a senator from New York. And he said, everyone's entitled to his own opinion, and I'll say his or her own opinion, uh, but not his or her own facts. And that's been one of the challenges during this pandemic. So this is the sort of thing we're going to cover. We're not going to cover all of these necessarily in, in detail, but I want to touch on these uh, and end up uh, with my common theme about justice and disparities. So just to put things in perspective, I think most of you know we're over 550,000 deaths in the United States. Uh, we haven't seen anything like this since the 1918 pandemic, but just to put this in perspective, there were over 50 million people worldwide who died in 1918 from this pandemic. And that's in a population that is one fourth what it is today. In the United States, we had almost 700,000 deaths. And again, with a population that was much smaller than it is today. Most of you know, in terms of deaths, it seems to be disproportional in the older age groups. But you can see here's the age distribution of who is getting infected with COVID. And you'll see that uh, we're beginning to see a shift towards the younger population. Uh, there are certainly a number of medical conditions that increase your risk of severe COVID. Uh, that include uncontrolled diabetes and obesity, you've probably heard about, uh, and if you're certain ethnic groups. Uh, and then the other question that's come up, uh, not so much now, but in the last month or month before that, people were wondering, are we really going into a fourth wave? The first wave being April and then July and then January, but it wasn't coming back. And I, I wanna show you this, the tale of two states. Now, to put this in perspective, most of you have heard about variants 
and we'll, we'll talk about that just very little, but the B117, which you see on the screen here, that's the UK variant. The UK variant is probably more transmissible than the wild type virus, but you can see that both Michigan and Texas had a predominance of this UK variant. Yet Michigan rates went sky high in March, now coming down, thank goodness. But Texas, even though restrictions have been, or the mandate has been lifted, you can see our rates have continued to come down. So it really, it depends upon where you are, but there certainly wasn't the widespread COVID outbreaks we saw back in January. So here is April where most of it was in the Northeast and to some extent somewhat in the Midwest. We had the very large surge in the Southern half of the United States in July. Uh, Houston, by the way, uh, had much greater impact in July than we had in January. But January was much more widespread across the entire country. You can see we've rapidly come down. We began to kind of level off. And I'm really happy to tell you that rates are now continuing to come down. Uh, interesting by countries, by the way, you know, the UK has had a very interesting strategy and I won't get into the difference between one dose versus two doses, but they rapidly immunized as many people as they possibly could with just one dose and didn't worry about the second dose initially. Look what they've done to their rates. And of course the UK is now opening. The United States has certainly come down. I showed you some rates that kind of leveled off. Now it's coming back down again, but our, but our cousins have, across the northern border, unfortunately, Canada hasn't done as well. And Canada, unfortunately, is still closed. Uh, and they've been way behind on vaccinations. Uh, we've also seen a tremendous improvement in hospitalizations, especially in our most vulnerable. Look at this curve. Look at how rapidly uh, hospitalizations have come down uh, in, our, in our age over 70. And you can see, as I mentioned before, the rate of transmission is actually now higher in our younger ages than they are in our older population. Now, if this is Houston, uh, this is Memorial Hermann Health System, which is the largest health system in, in, uh, Texas, in, in Houston and Harris County. Uh, you can see we had this huge surge in July. This is both this is non-ICU and ICU. Uh, we didn't go up quite as high, I'm happy to say, uh, in, in January, but nonetheless, we, we got a big hit. And then you can see the ICU trends, but you can see in both areas, the number of people in-house, both non-ICU and ICU have come down significantly and continue to come down. Another number which I look at, and this is for Harris County, that the number of new cases uh, per 100,000 is now down to seven. Uh, we say if it's less than 10, that's pretty good. I really feel good when the rates are less than five. So all the measures are heading in the right direction. I've already mentioned when this pandemic first hit, there was a huge knowledge gap and we tried to rely on other viruses that were similar to SARS-CoV-2, which is the same thing as COVID-19. But it turns out this virus acts really different. We've never seen a virus like this. So I wanna tell you a few things about what we've learned. I'm not gonna go through all of these. I put in highlights the things I think would be most applicable to this uh, audience. That the first thing we learned that was a real game changer was that 40% of infections are either asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. That was a real game changer. We said in the beginning, you didn't have to wear a mask unless you had symptoms. As you know, that turned out to be incorrect. Not because our, our public health people were uh, were stupid. It was because we relied on the SARS virus from 2003, which acts very, very different from this virus. And of course, our guidance changed. We know that you can get virus before symptoms begin. So potentially asymptomatic people can transmit to others. And now there's a growing body of evidence that the virus is transmitted both by small and large droplets. I won't get too, too deep uh, into the science. We know that masking and social distancing works and that transmission really is related to behavior. And one of the things that has been my biggest frustration is trying to guide organizations, both locally and nationally, is trying to deal with the media. <laughs> and they have tried to make truth by fear and bullying. There hasn't been a consistent message uh, around the science. It's more based on fear or politics. And what's happened is we have decreased the public trust 
uh, in the people that we rely on to, to be transparent and give us the real message. And if you look at this, this is a great article from the New York Times. Uh, it talks about bad news bias. And what they basically said was almost 90% of COVID coverage in the US last year before the vaccine became available, which is this dotted line over here, was negative. Uh, and they love to emphasize when cases were rising. And then recently, they, when cases were falling in most states, they focused on those places where the cases were rising. So you heard a lot about Michigan, but you didn't hear a lot about Texas, okay? Because Texas rates were not rising. Now, one of the things that, that really hurts me significantly is what's happened to people's trust in the CDC. As you can see here, it actually has gone down during this pandemic. And they had some missteps with testing in the beginning and messaging has been a little bit unclear at times. I understand that, but there's some really fine men and women who work in public health at the CDC who have been working tirelessly during this pandemic. But look at this, the United States Postal Service has a higher trust factor than the CDC. Who would ever think that would happen, <laughs> right? And at the bottom, I, I did want to kind of perhaps put some of this in perspective that when we think about public health and we're advising populations, the public health perspective probably needs to be viewed through different lenses than perhaps we do on an individual perspective. And I think that'll become a little clearer as we go on. Uh, this has to do with medical stuff. We've certainly learned a lot more about how to treat this disease. I won't go through that. One thing that's clear that these vaccines are amazing, and I'll show you uh, the data from the vaccines in just a moment. Operation Warp Speed was clearly a triumph. Whether you like the previous administration or not, this is one of the things they did right. And I've, I've had this dream, folks, that we had Donald Trump and Joe Biden together. Okay, this, this ain't gonna happen, but I had this dream uh, where Joe Biden thanks Donald Trump for providing these vaccines in record time. And then Donald Trump turns around and thanks Joe Biden for having improved the distribution and getting more vaccine into people's arms. And both of them together saying, get vaccinated. What do you think the likelihood of that is, huh? <laughs> uh, I'd love to see pray. that. We can pray. Uh, we can pray, right? Nice dream. Yep. It's not, <laughs> it's not a nightmare. It's a dream. So. Uh, we, we'll talk a little bit about variants a little bit later. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about schools in just a moment. It impacts our congregation and our schools. Uh, there are clearly non-COVID medical consequences that we need to really strongly think about. Uh, I can tell you that clinical trials need to be better coordinated. Our supply chain was broken. Uh, I try not to get ahead of the science. And we've certainly underinvested in public health for decades. And we were really very poorly prepared. You know, we had, we had a pandemic in 2009, which was sort of a, for, fortunately it was a wimpy virus. And we, did, we didn't really change what we were doing, even though there were some warning signs in 2009. This shows the underinvestment in public health and especially in, in hospital preparedness. Uh, and I put this on uh, as, as, as an indicator to you about how fast we're beginning to see new emerging infectious diseases. I haven't even put a bowl on this or Zika, <laughs> uh, they're not even on this. But look at how fast these, this is a zoonotic disease, that is it comes from animals, uh, mostly through a mammal intermediary with civic for Mars, it's camels from MERS, which by the way is still circulating in the Middle East. Uh, we're not really sure about COVID-19. And the question is, look how fast these viruses are coming. The question is not if we're gonna have another emerging potential uh, pandemic, the question is when. And it's probably going to come a lot faster than previous pandemics. Now, one of the other big problems, as you probably know, has to do with the World Health Organization uh, and some of the infrastructure and some of the politics. But despite what you think about the World Health Organization, we need a strong and effective health, uh, World Health Organization to take the lessons learned from how to contain these emerging infections before they become worldwide. There's no question this has been a big hurt, <laughs> uh, as this slide indicates, to the world and certainly uh, in the United States, both medically, emotionally, mentally, 
uh, and, and, and certainly uh, financially. Uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about the clinical stuff because I think I mentioned this the last time, but the good news is about this virus. We always hear about the, the, the deaths of the people in the intensive care unit, which is horrible, but the vast majority of people have no, no symptoms or very mild symptoms. It's only the top 15% that may be hospitalized and only the 5% that become critically ill uh, that develop uh, problems that may require them to be on a mechanical ventilator. That's the subgroup that unfortunately uh, may die. <clears throat> and this, this virus, unlike any other virus we've seen, it can infect every organ. It can present as stroke. It can present as loss of taste and smell, obviously cough and shortness of breath. Uh, we've seen people have nausea and diarrhea. We've seen people who come in with heart attacks and a whole variety of laboratory abnormalities. No other virus affects so many different organ systems uh, that this virus does. We've also learned that after you recover, okay, you may have persistent symptoms. Uh, that's pretty, and then we have these people we call long haulers, and you can see the characteristics, fatigue, brain fog, headaches. I mean, look at this, loss of taste, loss of smell that persists for months on end, still trying to understand that uh, and figure out what we can do for this subgroup. Now, I've talked a little bit about transmission. I'm only gonna kind of concentrate to tell you that far and away, this is transmitted by large and small droplets, which I've boxed on this particular slide. Uh, the inanimate objects, that is the surfaces, uh, it turns out become much less important uh, as time has gone on, we've understood that. Obviously, if you come in contact with a contaminated surface with live virus and you get it on your hands and you don't wash your hands and you touch your, your, your eyes or your mouth, that is your mucous membranes, that can be another way in which this virus can be transmitted. The other good news is it, it doesn't look like there's much in the way of blood transfusions and very, very rare to get trans, trans, uh, transplacental infection. So that's, that's some of the, the good news about this. And just to give you an idea of risk of transmission, this, this gives you an idea. If, if you have a household contact, that's clearly a high risk uh, versus even a healthcare exposure where it's very, very low now that we know how to protect ourselves, what we call PPE. Now, this is public transportation. This is public transportation in China where they've had restrictions and everyone wears masks. But you can see if everyone does that, it's pretty low transmission. If you have no symptoms, you're much, like, much less likely to transmit than if you have severe symptoms, especially if you're actively coughing. So that's just a bit. So severity disease, coughing, uh, household contacts, okay? Uh, the CDC updated its transmission uh, to now include both small and large droplets. This was, a, 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 they did this on May the 7th, just oh, last yeah. week. There was absolutely no news conference or public uh, announcement about what is really a major change in the science on the CDC website. It just sort of got quietly put in last Friday without a lot of fanfare. And I'm gonna come back and talk about the big fanfare they had for masks, which I thought was over the top, uh, but yet they didn't talk about this. Really disappointing. Now, this is an important slide conceptually uh, to think about the four ways that can impact transmission. And this was put together by some of my colleagues in Boston. It's really nicely thought out, but I'm just going to go for it. First is forced air. I just talked to a bunch of canners <laughs> before this call. And of course, singing is forced air, choirs, those kinds of things. So they're concerned about that. Second, if you're symptomatic, remember I showed you if you're asymptomatic, you're much less likely to spread than if you're symptomatic, especially if you're coughing. Ventilation and distance, very, very important. One of the things that, that, that Beth Israel has done, uh, just amazing, uh, the staff there, they put in medical grade filters, they improve the number of outside air circulations, they put in some HEPA filters in some of the classrooms in the school. Uh, they did an amazing job of trying to improve ventilation because a, as this says, if you're in a proper ventilated space, the droplets are gonna get markedly diluted, okay? Uh, and therefore much less likely to transmit disease. And this has been shown over and over again in multiple studies. The only exception to this 
is if you're in a poorly ventilated space where there's a lot of people around, okay, people are not masking, you're not able to properly distance. Like if you're in a bar screaming at each other, okay, in very close quarters. Uh, so poorly ventilated spaces, overcrowding, uh, that's different from being in the sanctuary at Congregation Beth Israel. And then the duration, the longer you're in contact with people that may be infected, obviously the greater the risk of infection. Now, what about masks? Now, this is a nice conceptual slide to show you why we've gone to universal masking last spring. What we've learned is that there's a benefit for both the person who's infected as well as somebody who may be exposed. So here's a case where someone is infected, maybe coughing, generating lots of aerosols here. And you can see a certain percentage of those do get to this exposed contact who's not infected. They inhale these particles and they get infected. Now look what happens if the index case wears a mask, okay? You can see it blocks. Look how many aerosols are down up here. Look at how few are there, okay? A few of them might get across to the exposed contact, but the mask that they wear, although not like an N95 mask, this is a plain surgery, it does block some of the aerosols and what few aerosols may get through may not be enough of a, what we call a viral load to cause infection, or if it's such a low viral load, the infection will be much milder. So there's a benefit for both the infected person as well as the exposed person. Uh, the CDC, you probably heard about double masking. I'm only putting this because this came up. It really has to do with proper fit. So if you have a properly fitted mask, the risk, if both of you are wearing it, the risk of, of putting any particles in the air, this is these lower bars here, is very, very low. And I think I, uh, I, I wanna also emphasize, you gotta wear your mask appropriately. As this slide shows, and I think most of you know, it's gotta cover the nose and mouth, okay? Now, to show you how effective masks can be, I think I showed this slide perhaps the last time, is that there were two hairdressers who had symptoms, who came to work, who took care of 139 clients. They were diagnosed with COVID. The CDC went back and looked at all the close contact. They spent over 15 minutes with over almost 140 clients, okay? And none of them got infected. Just shows you how effective masking can be. So here's the CDC guidance that made such a big fanfare of this the end of last month. This is what they tell us we can do. Now, think about this for a moment. They told us that now we can walk, run, or bike outside, okay? And we can have small gatherings outside uh, with fully vaccinated family and friends. You know, even in Harris County, where Hidalgo has been relatively strict, uh, we had a mask mandate that went into effect, if you remember back in June, even during that mask mandate, even during July, which is our worst month for COVID, our guidance even said, if you're gonna walk and run and be outside uh, and you can socially distance, you don't have to wear a mask. So for us, this guidance didn't tell us anything new than what we were already doing. And then they talked about dining outside and all that kind of stuff. So you can't even dine outdoors if you're not vaccinated according to the CDC. You can see the other things here and I put in the big bar here because this is something that's gonna come up as we approach the high holidays. What do we do as we get more capacity or increase our capacity at worship service? And what do we tell our choirs? Uh, this is something that may or not come up later today, but it will certainly come up in our conversations with, uh, with leadership. Uh, uh, the vaccines are phenomenal. Now I wanna emphasize something because this is a theme that I wanna get back to at the end because I wanna get your opinions on this. One of the guiding principles of COVID vaccine allocation relating to ethical principles was A, to promote justice. That's why I start off with justice, justice. And B, to mitigate health inequities. So we're gonna go through this to see how well we've done. The next thing that's happening with vaccination, you know that people are talking about vaccine hesitancy. And there's no question it's true. It started with a J&J &J pause 
which was in April, which has now been uh, released. But you can see even, even after the J&J &J pause, there's been a drop off, okay, of both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines as well. And that's been of concern to people. Uh, there are also people who don't wanna get vaccinated, a solid people, 15%, repeatedly in this Kaiser uh, Foundation uh, poll say they definitely don't want it. There's a percentage that says, I'm only gonna do it if you make me do it. And then there's a group that says, wait and see. That wait and see group had actually decreased in numbers, but now with the J and J, their people are beginning to say, well, I'm not sure I wanna take the vaccine. Now, if you look at vaccine hesitancy, it's somewhat related in part to people with color, as you can see on the left. And you can see the percentage of confidence in vaccines. So, because the Pfizer and Moderna are the messenger RNA, the mRNA vaccines, <clears throat> Look at this, very confident, less than 50%. And if you take very confident and somewhat confident, it's still less than 75%. And these vaccines, we've had tens of millions of doses now with the mRNA vaccine. The J&J &J vaccine, you can somewhat understand because of the negative publicity about this rare blood clotting issue uh, that's now been identified, I think now up to 28 people out of millions of people that have been dosed. It's also, it's also something that people don't talk about. There's a group that says, I'm hesitant to get the vaccine. There's also a group that they're not hesitant to get the vaccine, but they don't know how to get access to the vaccine. And those two groups are about equal. It's about 30 million in each group. And if you look at this, it's the most vulnerable, the people who live in the lower socioeconomic groups that don't know how to get access to the vaccine or just not educated about the value of taking vaccines. And we've got to address all those. Uh, these are the variants in Houston, far and away. <clears throat> it's the UK variant, which is here. Uh, we call the Brazilian the P1 variant, <clears throat> the South African the 351 variant. I won't go through this. Some of these variants may be more transmissible. <clears throat> Some of them may be more severe, but as you'll see in a minute, uh, the UK variant makes up about 70 to 75% of our circulating strains right now. Here's the wild type strain which is right here. Now, I want to, this is a kind of a busy slide, but I want to emphasize something that I want you to take to the bank, folks, okay? The three vaccines in this country, Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J, &J, they're all highly effective, okay, uh, against protecting against hospitalizations and severe disease and deaths regardless. And I want you to hear, hear here's the variants over here on the right, regardless of whether the variant circulating in the community. These vaccines are just as effective against the UK variant as it is against the wild type. In terms of preventing mild disease, it's not as effective against the Brazilian and the South African, but it is as good as preventing severe disease and death. So to, to date, these vaccines are excellent at preventing severe disease and death. The other question that comes up is, what about asymptomatic disease? Remember I told you 40% may be asymptomatic or presymptomatic. We didn't know from the original vaccine trials of Moderna or Pfizer, did it prevent asymptomatic disease? So the way these trials are done is it's, as you know, there's a double blind placebo controlled trial. Uh, people who get symptoms come in for testing. Uh, and so when we talk about a 95% protective efficacy, that's against symptomatic disease. Now there's a number of studies that have gone back and looked at whether or not asymptomatic disease is prevented because that is another way of saying we can reduce not just asymptomatic disease, but we can reduce transmission. That's very, very important concept. And there's a variety of studies, some of which are in preprint form, some of which have been, have been uh, uh, published, but here's the trial that I want you to look at, okay? This is the Israeli trial. As you know, Israel has been extremely successful. They were really uh, smart. They decided to partner with Pfizer uh, to provide, get them the vaccine. And in, in return, they would be able to effectively study the rollout of the vaccine. So they've got great data. This is real world data, folks, by the way. This isn't a study. This is real world data from the Ministry of Health in Israel. They primarily uh, exclusively use the Pfizer vaccine. I want you to look at this. 94% in 
of asymptomatic infections were prevented in 97% against symptomatic disease, hospitalizations, severe disease, and deaths. And 80% of the variants in Israel during the time of rollout was the UK variant, which is the same variant that's circulating in the United States. Now, some people talk about breakthrough. And I, this is a very important slide to think about. If I've been fully vaccinated, what's my risk of getting an infection? Well, the risk is not zero. But if you've been fully vaccinated two weeks after your final second dose, you have less than a 0.01% chance that you will get infected. Of those that get infected, they tend to either be asymptomatic or very mild. However, there have been less than 100 people that have had a severe disease breakthrough, some of them being immunocompromised and have unfortunately died. But that's out of almost 80 million fully vaccinated people in the United States, less than 0.01, 0.01. Now, if you've had natural disease, this one study that was published a week or so ago, uh, the breakthrough rate's about 0.7%. As you know, the CDC recommends if you're within three, three months, you really got great protection. Uh, you don't have to worry if you get exposed in terms of quarantine. Uh, but the reason I put these two studies side by side or top and, down, top and bottom uh, is because vaccination gives you a much more robust response than natural disease does. So even if you've had natural disease, you should still get vaccinated because the percent protection is so much greater. Again, real world experience for those of us that are over age 65, if we've gotten both doses and it's two weeks after that second dose, we've got a 94% reduction in the risk of being hospitalized. Wow, 94%. Now at the bottom, I put something that I want you to sort of put in your, in your mind. The case fatality rate for people over age 65 is about one in a hundred. It goes up for each five to 10 years of, uh, older, okay, but it's about one in 100 for all people over age 65. With the vaccinated group, with how rare the breakthroughs are, your likelihood of potentially getting infected is less than one to 20,000. That's as good, if not better, than we got for protection from the influenza vaccine in our older population. So vaccinations or making COVID look more like routine flu. That's, that's our hope, okay? It's flu, of course, we don't shut the country down. So just think about that for a moment. Now we've got to improve vaccine uh, acceptance. We have to have trusted leaders in their community. It doesn't do any good if Ed Septimus goes to a, uh, a black church. It's much more effective if that black minister gets up there and tells his congregation to get vaccinated, a trusted leader. We have to have consistent messaging based on science, remove some of those barriers to be vaccinated. I remember there's a whole group of people that just don't know how to get access. And I believe it's a moral obligation, not just to prevent our, uh, promote our own health, but what about the community, okay? Because if we fall short, we may not get to that concept of herd immunity. And that's very important. If we do get vaccinated, CDC told us in March, if you're vaccinated, you can mingle with other people without restrictions, indoor or outdoor. We can take our masks off. We don't have to social distance anymore. That's pretty good. And if we get exposed, we don't have to quarantine. But if we're unvaccinated around other unvaccinated people, it's restrictions as, as always. Now, what about back to school? This is one of my, uh, my, my passions. I'm going to show you a couple of slides that show that with appropriate mitigation strategy, Transmission in school is extremely low, but we can't control what our children do when they get out of school. They go to parties, they have play dates, okay? Uh, and so transmission is much more common in the community than it would be in the classroom. And then if you look at uh, this wonderful study from Wisconsin, here's the, here's the community rate in Wisconsin, it was really going up in November, okay? And then they looked at school transmission. Look at where school transmission is, all the way here at the bottom. Very, very little school transmission, despite high rates of transmission in the community. They had a very high percentage of, of mass compliance and other mitigation. Bottom line is schools can open safely if mitigation strategies are in place. Now, 
Here's where I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit, folks. Do you know that most students still have not returned to anything resembling a normal school schedule? Okay. Not everybody can go to Schlenker. Nearly 30% of students are still in this mixed in-person and virtual instruction with all the learning challenges that we know go with that kind of a hybrid matter. This has had a tremendous impact on the psychological well-being of our children, and as I'll show you, also suicide rates, which is really impactful, okay? And the people who are disadvantaged are Black or Latino populations, children with disabilities, okay? People who English language, they're English language learners. They have been impacted much greater than that, and they are falling further and further behind. The children who live in poverty, are falling behind. And unfortunately, some districts still continue to debate whether you can safely open schools. The short-term and long-term significance of this is, I cannot tell you, is overwhelming. Some of these children will never catch up. In addition, while people are going back to work, there's one large group of Americans whose employment rates remain far below their pandemic levels. If we were in person, I would ask you what that group is. It's the mothers of young children. The mothers of young children. As you probably know, because of political pressure, the teachers got pushed up to the top of the food chain to get vaccinated. What about the laborers that have to come in person to do their job? They're essential workers also. The teachers are gonna get paid whether they do it remotely or not. They're getting paid all year. I, I, it just really makes me very, very mad. Now, we just know that the 12 to 13, 15 year olds just got approval from the FDA and the CDC. Uh, I want you to think about some perspective here. 3.8 million children have been infected with, with, with COVID since the beginning of the pandemic. Of course. That's far short of the millions, of course, in the United States that have been infected. Most children do not get severely diseased. Thousands have been hospitalized. And fortunately, only hundreds have died. I mean hundreds, as compared to 600,000, almost 600 who have died in the United States. So this is what I'm saying is this is a low risk population. As I've already mentioned, however, children have suffered in so many ways in terms of mental and emotional health, not being able to fully engage in activities. And I've already mentioned about the 30% of children who are in this mixed in-person virtual learning and they're falling farther and farther behind. So the question that I want all of you to think about, remember we're talking about justice and disparities. Should we be using our vaccine to immunize a low risk population in the United States or should we be helping the world fight the pandemic? Remember, we're in a global society and share that vaccines with other countries that are hard hit. I used India as an example, okay? Here are the unintended consequences from getting behind on immunizations, preventive care, chronic disease, domestic and mental illness, opioid and alcohol dependence uh, and cancer morbidity and mortality. And if you look at our children, folks, if you care about our children, teachers, I want you to hear me. Look how that's impacted the mental health of our children. There are far more children committing suicide than there are children who are dying of COVID. Now, I'm gonna briefly talk about herd immunity. And I, I went to Dr. Google and I got the Merriam-Webster definition, which by the way is the same as public health. So, uh, but it's good to see that we're talking the same language. And I want you to understand what it is and what it isn't, okay? It's a reduction in the risk of infection due to a specific infection, this time we're talking about COVID, that occurs in a significant portion of the population, okay, or when a significant portion of the population becomes immune, and that can either be due by prior exposure or prior infection or vaccination. So that the number of susceptible individuals in our community are much less likely to come in contact with an infected individual. Notice it doesn't say zero or eradication. That's not the goal of herd immunity. And I'd like to tell you that we're gonna to go to zero, but that's highly unlikely. And if you look at it from a scientific perspective, herd immunity has really been this mathematical guess. Bottom line, and this is my opinion, I don't think we really know. 
some respected public health authorities, you've heard them say 75, 85%, the goalposts seem to be moving higher. <laughs> uh, but I think it's, it's, first of all, a great idea to be immunized, okay? Uh, and secondly, if you add up the number who've already been immunized, with those that probably have had natural immunity from prior infection, I think we're a lot closer to herd immunity than some people think. And I think the closer we are, again, we're talking about containment. So in Harris County is an example, okay? Uh, Harris County now is about 5 million people. And we've now immunized one or both doses at about 3.2 million. So we're getting there, okay? Uh, Okay, and so here are some of the, the reasons why we couldn't achieve herd immunity from, there's a lot of misinformation. The internet's got some great conspiracy theory, theories out there. We talked about the social determinants, the anti-vaxxers, uh, obviously uh, some of the PR stuff, the supply issue, which is not an issue anymore in the United States, the variants, I hope I've convinced you that variants uh, are handled very, very nicely by this group of uh, uh, vaccines and then herd immunity. Uh, this is a wonderful way to think about how we can contain this virus from personal responsibility here on the left, staying home when you're sick. Even when COVID goes away, guys, we shouldn't be coming to work with any kind of uh, illness. Uh, hand hygiene, cough etiquette, making sure you limit the amount of time you spend in crowded, poorly ventilated spaces. Improve your ventilation. Do things outdoors if you can the issue of quarantine and isolation, which I won't get into, but I think vaccinations that I've already mentioned, it's not only a personal responsibility for your own health, it's a shared responsibility for the health of our community. You know, some people think about seatbelts. That's why do we put seatbelts on? We, well, number one, they're mandated. Number two, because it saves lives, doesn't it? But if I don't put my seatbelt on when I go home tomorrow and I get into a serious car accident and I am unfortunately have severe injury or I unfortunately die, the only person I hurt is myself. If I don't get vaccinated, I may spread that to vulnerable people. So not only am I going to get sick, I am going to impact the health of other people in our community. This is a shared responsibility. I think it's a moral obligation for all of us to do everything we can to cut down on this pandemic. Will we be ready for the next pandemic? I hope we will. I hope we've learned our lesson. And I hope to be able to put COVID uh, in our rear view mir mirror as we get closer and closer to the fall. Bottom line is get vaccinated. I've already talked about the value of vaccinating, especially in our most vulnerable population. These vaccines are much more expensive than influenza vaccine, folks. Influenza vaccine in a good year with a good max, maybe 50 to 60% effective. These are 90 to 95% effective against both symptomatic and asymptomatic disease. These are incredible vaccines. In the end, as we approach greater and greater capacity at services and as the high holidays approach, I think each of us individually are gonna to have to think about precautions that should be based on individual circumstances. If you're not immunized and you're immunocompromised or being around other immunocompromised individuals, you need to take that into account, whether or not you want to come to services as an example. And we'll be trying to message that over the next couple of months. Now, I'm going to come back to my theme, justice, justice, you shall pursue, with three, three comments here. One, I think we betray the heritage of Torah when we fail to recognize justice and righteousness as a basic core of what it means to be a Jew. And David, you can correct me if I'm wrong about these things. To do what is right, not just in our firm commitment to making the world a more just and righteous pace, it's part of our DNA. And as many of you have heard Rabbi Hillel's quote, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? So I'm going to quit on that. And I hope, oh, so here's the questions I have for the group. We have uh, 10 or 15 minutes for comments. So here are the two questions I want to throw out to people that are far smarter about these things than I am. What have you heard that relates to social justice and health inequities? And what do you think we ought to do about it? And how do you think this relates to our Jewish values?
Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll let uh, David uh, coordinate the, the question and answers. Well, thank I, hope you. I hope you'll answer some of those questions. I really try to frame this around our Jewish values and how what we've learned about this pandemic and what we've learned about health inequities uh, and the disadvantage and how that's impacted us and how we can improve the world uh, by looking at our Jewish values. So I'll quit there. That's wonderful. Thank you, Ed. Such an informative and really detailed presentation uh, and very helpful to provide this kind of context. Thank you for your time and your efforts. There have been a few questions as you've uh, been going through it. And uh, I thought we might just gently or briefly respond to some of the questions because there's some practical questions in the chat. And I think your, your, your question that you gave to us is also extremely important and relevant as we're thinking about social justice and as we're thinking about how, where our Jewish values fit into ensuring everyone's you know, collective safety and as we, we want our community to continue to be safe, both within the internal, inside the congregation, you've been involved with our task force and that you've heard about the steps we've taken to open up more as that continues through the high holidays, as you mentioned. Uh, but what about ball, uh, airplanes, ballparks, kind of the other rest of our lives? What do you expect the next three to six months will look like um, there's a question here about uh, the flu vaccine. Will the, that's going to also include uh, a COVID-19 booster? And what about people who uh, didn't, or maybe, I think the J&J &J vaccine, what, what is this, what's the issue of boosters there? How should we expect this to be treated going forward just within the community uh, as it relates to boosters and how long they're going to last? Well, great question. Uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, traveling and airplanes, uh, this air circulation on airplanes are, is excellent, okay? I don't have any problem with ventilation. As you know, most airlines have now who are blocking middle seats are no longer blocking middle seats. I have not traveled, but many people that I know have traveled and say now the planes are full again, <laughs> okay? You also know that there's a national mandate that says you have to mask, of course, when you are on airplanes and in airports, et cetera. Uh, I, I certainly think since we have a mixed group of people that are immunized, we haven't really achieved that magical term herd immunity yet, that the best way, first of all, you're much safer to travel if you've been fully immunized. Let me put that right up, right up front, okay? Secondly, if you, if you choose to travel, even if you've been fully immunized, even though breakthroughs are very rare, okay, in a mixed group of people, you should continue to social distance and wear masks and, and wash your hands appropriately. In terms of ballparks, uh, what they did in Arlington when they opened up the baseball season, I was a little bit miffed where they had no capacity limits. <laughs> I thought that was going a little bit too far to give you an example. Uh, when the Astros opened up, they, uh, they opened up at 50% capacity. Uh, and I think given where things are, I still think we have to remember we're, we're going into, into areas we don't know who we're next to, who's coming to the ballpark, whether they've been immunized, are they immunocompromised? What about our children who come because under age 12, they're not gonna be immunized. They, they still can get infected and transmit. So I think we, while we're at the ballpark, we need to take all the mitigation strategies that you take if you come to services live uh, right now. Uh, I think we should continue to look at rates in our community. Rates in our communities are really nice now. It's seven per 100,000. That's really great. When it gets below five per 100,000, which is where it's heading to, uh, that's really great news. Uh, and we'll have to see how low it's going to get. But at least for now, social distance, wear your mask. Uh, if you're going to be in a crowd, whether you're inside or outside, okay, because most ballparks are outside. Uh, and so I think you have to know that you're, you're in a mixed group with multiple families coming together. We still have to take those precautions. Airline travel, I think, is relatively safe. Uh, but I do agree with the CDC. It's much safer if you've been fully immunized. So that's, that's the way I look at it. In terms of boosters and things, <clears throat> we really don't know how long these vaccines are good for. We think they're gonna be, they're gonna be good for at least six to eight months, if not longer. I won't go through some of the immunology about what these vaccines do. Uh, there may or may not be a booster that may occur in the future. As you know, some of the vaccine manufacturers are coming up with boosters that are more effective against the variants. Uh, that may come to pass at, at some point as well. So right now, stay tuned. Get, get your at least your first series right now. In terms of the J and J vaccine, the J and J vaccine is still a very good vaccine. Uh, it doesn't require the cold storage. It's currently one dose. Uh, when the J and J vaccine 
studies were being done. It was done later than the Pfizer and Moderna. And I only make mention of that because there were some of the variants that had already begun to emerge and some of the J&J &J vaccine studies were done in South Africa and other countries as well. So it looks like their, their efficacy looks a little bit lower. But again, severe disease and death, they work, it works extremely well. There is the issue of, I, I will say in premenopausal women, uh, within the first one to two weeks after vaccine, getting this rare, what they call thrombotic, thrombocytopenic syndrome, which is a, a clot, uh, essentially a clot inside the brain, which can be life-threatening. It's a serious complication. It's a very low risk. Uh, and so premenopausal women may want to be counseled. But for all other people, it offers the advantage of one dose. For instance, we're talking now, let's say you have a disadvantaged community, you wanna send out someone to get vaccinated, you send a vaccine mobile uh, out to some of our Hispanic communities, okay? And you offer to them right there or in, their, in, in the park. We go to the park with, Dr., uh, with Rabbi Sadoff, right? <laughs> um, it's very likely we're gonna get those people back, okay? And so the J&J &J vaccine is, 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 it works very well. We're thinking in hospitalized patients, uh, we're now going to probably be asking people if they've been immunized when they get to for two reasons. First of all, we want to know if they have a breakthrough. Uh, but secondly, if they haven't been immunized, is that an opportunity to get them immunized? We've done this with flu and pneumonia vaccines in the past. Uh, and so again, the challenge is if they have to get two doses, like with Moderna and Pfizer, we have to make sure they have a return appointment. And you know, some of those logistics might be able to be worked out. But if we use the J&J &J vaccine, it's just one dose. So those are some of the considerations <clears throat> for some of these vaccines. We may have other vaccines over, over time, but right now I think Moderna and Pfizer, to be honest with you, they're going to be doing the heavy lifting for vaccinations in this country with, with some J&J, with some &J. but J&J &J does offer the advantage. It's also cheaper. And it's a vaccine you can send to underdeveloped countries and just immunize people once. So I think there's a place for all these vaccines. Uh, and I think... Uh, I don't know whether or not we're going to require a boost, and if so, when? My guess is maybe, but I don't know when. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I think also there's another question just as we're thinking through our Jewish values, and I want to think about uh, people who are willing to take the vaccines, people who are not willing to take the vaccines, how we relate to them, but also the consistent messaging from, uh, this is to Jacob's question, about what the community itself, the different, different agencies, different organizations, uh, assisted living facilities, uh, for example, how are we communicating and, and making sure that there is consistent messaging throughout the community? Well, that's been one of the challenges throughout this entire pandemic is consistent messaging. Uh, I think we've gotten better, to be honest with you. Uh, but as I mentioned before, this, this lack of trust in the CDC and in other public health agencies uh, really uh, has hurt. And there's also some, some websites, there's this natural called natural, I can't remember the second part of that name, which is a, a left-wing anti-vaxxer website that people have actually gone to and sent me the link. And it's, I can tell you, it's pure garbage, folks. There's also, you know, I'm learning something new every day. One of our schools, not, not Beth Israel, somebody sent me a letter from a rabbi. I sent this to Rabbi Lyon, actually, okay? that gave them a religious exemption not to take the vaccine. It's from an ultra-Orthodox Hasidic rabbi in Israel who he, he himself is not a big, he's not necessarily anti-vaxxer, but he doesn't exactly promote vaccines either. It's that kind of stuff that's out there that makes it really, really difficult. So I think, as I mentioned in my slide, you need to find the right spokesperson that people trust in their community to deliver the message. Thank and you. That, that, that's a key thing. I think that uh, Jacob had his hand up. Yeah, let's open it up to some discussion. Jacob, uh, why don't you articulate more what your question was? Yeah, very sure. I mean, I just got <clears throat> I just got a, a notice here that the CDC um, has issued a guidance that um, mask wearing in, inside uh, should be ditched, meaning that I mean, this is just just came out. Um, so I don't I don't know what that means, <laughs> and I don't know how um, it's going to be interpreted. Um, but I mean, I, I said it just came out on the on the on the on the uh, news wire. So um, they just I, I guess just came out with it just now. Uh, uh, 
How, how does that get interpreted? How does that get interpreted by, by Health and Human Services, for example, in, in Houston, in Texas? I, I have to see the guidance, Jacob. I mean, it just shows you how fast things can change. <laughs> here, here I am giving something. I mean, the CDC came out with its mask guidance just the end of last month, okay? Um, I, I don't know what it says. I, I'm, I'm, I, I would say if someone would ask me, if you're indoors, okay, with fully vaccinated people, take your masks off and don't worry about social distancing. I don't know what this guidance shows, so I really can't comment on it from a scientific perspective, but you can see how confused, you re raising a point, you can see how confused people are. There was this huge fanfare about relaxing masking outside by the CDC, and then basically you should always wear your mask inside. That was just a week or two ago. And now they come out and say, oh no, it's okay, you don't have to wear your mask inside. I, again, I have to see what the qualifications are uh, of what they're saying before I can actually respond to it, Jacob. Uh, I the, 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 and the question really has to do, and not, not necessarily with this, this particular edict today, but uh, Health and Human Services in Texas, for example, has these unbelievable restrictions still with, for, uh, for uh, assisted living facilities. I have my 98-year-old mom who has, has suffered greatly in, in 15 months and um, has really pretty much lost her mind because of, of, of isolation and everything yes. else. And yes. they still they still make, I mean, even though I can now visit her, uh, they still make me wear a mask, you know, you know, and I, and I, and I, don't, I don't blame the facility, but I'm, you know, they're getting their guidance from the Health and Human Services, which is a governmental agency that really should be coordinating with the CDC. So I don't, I don't understand. Well, yeah, there are some local differences uh, across the country. Uh, yeah, this again, this gets people don't like to be asked to show proof of immunization. You know, you, you've heard that argument. I don't want to get into the politics of this, but here's a situation that if you're fully immunized and your loved one is fully, you're going to visit that person. There's no reason that you need to wear a mask. <laughs> tell that to the tell that to health and human services. But, but, but the, the problem is, I don't think people want to ask you or they'll think they have the right to ask you whether or not you've been immunized. Now, if you haven't been immunized and you're going to see uh, your 90-year-old mother, then I can understand why there's some restrictions. But if you're fully immunized and they're fully immunized, you know, there's no reason you have to wear a mask in that situation. So I think, I, I think there's some, you know, we can talk about what about cruise ships as an example. Uh, and people don't want to don't want to say you. I mean, I think it's it's reasonable if you want to take a cruise, given what kind of a petri dish it is, uh, that you ought to be able to show proof of immunization before you get on that boat. <laughs> okay, but there again, there's all these privacy issues that people raise that sometimes get in the way of what I think is good public health policy. And, and, to, just, and to your value statement earlier about social justice and what are the ethics here. Um, it is a balancing act about privacy on the one hand and respecting the public health of the community on the other hand. And I think that's a really important tension that we're living through right now to try to uh, arrive at a reasonable solution for a congregational worship, for a cruise ship or whatever it might be that's going to involve a lot of people coming together. So the Jewish value of protecting a life, that is what is, is central. And pikuach uh, nefesh, saving a life, uh, it is certainly relevant to the discussion. So it's an, it's an ongoing, I think, dilemma that we have to continue managing and, and thinking through. Um, there are more questions and, and comments. I know that Ed will, will stick around uh, for a few minutes later yeah. as well, if you'd like to, to stick around. But I do, I do want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, and thank you, Ed, for a wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation and discussion about these issues and, and where we are. It looks like we've come a long way. I know we're all grateful to see the light at the end of the tunnel and most of us hopefully have been vaccinated. I also wanna just take a moment to acknowledge uh, Israel and what, what Israel is dealing with right now um, with, uh, with, with Hamas and with the bombings and the, and, and, and the, and the missiles, uh, et cetera, and the rockets that have been falling. It's a very challenging situation and we're concerned and we're continuing to pray on behalf of the people of Israel as well. Um, and also to, to put out the, the fact that we aren't being able to travel to Israel and the airports, of course, both now, I understand airports have been shut down, 
So uh, in lieu of physically going to lend our support and, and be there in person, we are coordinating an opportunity for us to go there and to travel to Israel online. And that's happening May 23rd, 24th, and 25th. All of us are welcome and invited to participate. You can go online to the Temple website and select which dates, if not all dates, uh, join us from 11 o'clock to 12.30. And the guide, uh, Liana Rothstein, who would be our guide in person if we were going, uh, will be taking us through the streets of Jerusalem and talk, talking to us more about the current situation, what we have, what they're dealing with currently politically and, 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 and militarily. Uh, the next trip to Israel will be happening, God willing, in 2022 on May 8th to the 18th. Registration is now open for that trip as well. So with that, uh, yes, uh, Miriam, I see your hand. I see that you've recorded. Uh, yes. Yeah. I have multiple family members who are anti-vaccination. I'm so scared for them. I don't even know what to do. But um, can I, is there a way for me to access this? Will it be on YouTube or? Sure. Thanks, Miriam. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now and, uh, and thank everybody for coming.